I assume people can hear me. Excellent. OK, hi. I'm uh, Roy Rappaport. A uh, few words about me. Hopefully, this is actually contextual rather than me just you know, talking about myself. I've been in technology for about 20 years. I've done a whole bunch of stuff, which basically tells you that I'm not particularly good at any one thing. Um, I've been at Netflix for a while. Uh, some people who know me at Netflix know that I typically actually count these things in days. Uh, that doesn't mean I haven't liked it. It's just that I'm, I'm just that kind of guy. Uh, I work in monitoring engineering, by the way, where we build the telemetry and, and alerting platform for uh, Netflix. So it's a, it's a good place for uh, somebody who you know, looks at telemetry as a way to sort of distinguish his uh, experience at Netflix. Before I was at, uh, you know, on the monitoring engineering side, I was in IT ops. As Gene mentioned, I'm one of, I think, maybe eight people or so who moved over from IT ops in the last few years to the engineering side as part of the migration to the cloud. Um, I was a troubleshooter. I built a bunch of Python things. Um, I was the first person who operated a bunch of Python stuff in our cloud and wrote a bunch of uh, libraries to do that that all other people used because it was either that or learn Java. Um, I've got nothing against Java. So um, here's one more thing about me, actually. Um, this is my commute to work. It's about 50 minutes on a good day. It's about 45 miles each way. This is actually relevant because this is the reason why I chose uh, this car. This, is, <laughs> this car is much cleaner than mine, uh, but it's the same model. It's a Honda Elantra 2011. And uh, it gets about 32 miles per gallon, which is pretty decent and kind of important if you're driving 45 miles each way. This is not the Hyundai Elantra 2011. This is a Maserati Quattroporte 2009. It's significantly more powerful. It has horrific gas mileage. Now, the reason I'm, I bring this up is because you don't get one of these cars for a purpose for which the other car is good. I actually have an acquaintance uh, who owns a Maserati uh, Quattroporte 2009, and the reason I was thinking of, of that particular car is because I recently heard him complain to me about the gas mileage he got on his way to LA. <laughs> I get to complain about gas mileage. If you drive a Maserati, you don't. <laughs> so the whole point is that if you look at something and you try to figure out whether or not it is a good thing, and I'm being very vague here, you've got to look at what are you actually designing this thing for. So when we talk about cloud operations at Netflix, we have to start with what's actually important to Netflix. Um, and the number one thing that's important to Netflix is speed of innovation. Above anything else, above, in fact, the number two thing, which is availability, at least on the operations uh, side, um, it, speed of innovation is the key. Because we're pretty much never going to be available enough to beat our competitors. Nobody's ever going to go, well, you know, that other company has much better personalization, and they really help me find the stuff that I want. But, you know, they have like 99.995 availability, and Netflix has 100% availability, so I'm just going to give Netflix my, my $7.99 a month. So speed of innovation is really the key for us. Uh, availability is second, and frankly, uh, cost is third. It's a, it's a nice place to be if you're an engineer and you're interested in getting stuff done. And if you look at how we've designed the company and the culture to actually support our priorities, what you find is that the first thing we talk about, and Adrian talked about this, is freedom and responsibility. Freedom and responsibility has a whole bunch of elements of it. But basically, what you can look at that is we hire smart people, and we hire smart, experienced people. Um, the, the difference is distinct, because there's really not a lot of supervision at Netflix. I'm, I'm a manager at Netflix. and. Managing a Netflix is, in some respects, the easiest job in the world because you've got a bunch of really smart people who just know what they need to be doing. Um, so in order to do that, they need to have some experience to know, you know how to figure out what it is that you need to be doing. So we hire those smart people. We basically set them loose. And then we watch magic happen. So you know, one way to look at that is uh, the people who are the keynote talked about you know, we need better requirements. We need better product managers. Um, for my team, again, we build monitoring and uh, uh, alerting platforms. That means that our engineers are product managers. And that means that, for example, recently when we were completely overhauling our alerting platform, I had uh, my engineer who was going to be responsible for that. I basically said to her, listen, I'm hoping that we're going to be somewhat backwards compatible to whatever degree you think is reasonable. Have a nice day. And she went and talked to a bunch of customers and recruited some UI people and some UX people. And then a month and a half later, 
came up with something that, frankly, if I came up with requirements, would not have in any way been what I required. It was just so much better, so unimaginable. And, and this is the kind of surprise that I, I think managers here at Netflix get a lot. When you unleash engineers to do something, when you don't constrain what it is they're going to do, it's, it's incredible. So getting back to operations, I want to talk about what operations you know, does and I think frankly should do as a previous operations guy. This is something I feel passionate about. But almost as passionate about uh, how operations should do things and what it should do, I'm also passionate and, and, and maybe more ranty, to be honest, about what operations shouldn't do. So let's start with this. Uh, how many people here have ever worked in uh, organizations where operations uh, deploys code that engineering gives them? Okay. And how many of you guys um, were told that the, way, the reason we do this is because of separation of duties? Okay. So here's the thing. There's no such thing. Like separation of duties, this thing that was, yeah, okay, so, so was made up. It's not in SOX. It's not in ISO. In fact, um, there's a presentation that John DeLuca, I want to say, James DeLuca, from um, Ernst & Young, gives later on in the day about compliance. You go talk to James, because I had, I had dinner with James last night, and, and I was talking to him, and I was like, separation of duties, and he's like, yeah, that's not a thing. Um, so the other thing that, uh, you know, we, I don't think operations should do is managed by runbook. And, and there's a bunch of reasons for ma why managing by runbook is just terrible. For one thing, it externalizes the cost of operations. Managing by runbook basically means that as developers, you, can de you get to deploy pretty bad code that, for example, might require the server to be rebooted like every few hours. And I've been there. And I've been on the far side of that runbook. And, and, and at least one developer from Netflix right now is laughing here. Um, and basically, you can deploy bad code that requires server reboots and then you know, add to the runbook. When the, ser when the server hits this percentage memory utilization, go ahead and reboot the server. It's, it's terrible. And the other thing that it does is it frankly makes your operations people stupid. This is something that I realized actually only recently. You know, We used to have a knock. And the knock at Netflix was kind of stupid. And I was really interested in making our knock smarter. So I recruited a bunch of like pretty senior sysadmins that I knew from like previous times to join our knock because our hope was that by putting smart people into a stupid organization, you would make a smart organization. It, it, it actually turns out that what you do when you put smart people in a stupid organization is you get a bunch of stupid people. And, and I don't mean this like as, as a derogatory term about these people because I know that as soon as they left, that organization, they became smart again. <laughs> but if you look at the last keynote of the day, uh, I want to say Linda is talking about myths of organizational change. You can't just put smart people in a dumb organization and expect the organization to get smarter. Um, the other thing that you really should try to not do is stop people from making mistakes, which may seem a little counterintuitive. Uh, there's a reason, f there's, there's a few reasons uh, for that. One is, you know, fundamentally you're creating conflict because nobody actually thinks they're making a mistake when they make a mistake. You know, I've never seen a deployment go bad at Netflix where when we did a postmortem, and I'll talk about the postmortem later, um, the engineer in question was like, you know, I knew that was the wrong thing to do. I knew that was a mistake, but I did it anyway. So you're creating unnecessary conflict. The other thing is that you're working around the problem, which is frankly judgment. Um, and you're working around basically uh, an a endemic problem that you should, that you should actually deal with uh, head on. And the last thing is that you're actually stopping people from making the right call. For one thing, if you're trying to make people uh, not make mistakes, you're assuming that your judgment is right there. For another thing is you can't actually presume that you're going to know always what the right call is. We recently had a problem with a vendor where somebody did something that completely violated their policies and they caused us some downtime. And I'm, Really not going to mention the vendor. So we had a call with them. It was one of those calls where you have a bunch of senior people from their side, and they're feeling really apologetic. And they're like, OK, listen, so here's what we're going to do to make sure this doesn't happen again. We're going to make sure that our tools do not allow people to violate policy. OK, so that's great. As long as your tools never get in your way of making the right decision when some sort of condition actually comes up where the right decision is to violate policy. That would never fly with us. 
And I think it, should, frankly, should not fly in, uh, anywhere else. And lastly, it also means that, frankly, you're lowering the bar for what successful people in your organization need to display in terms of judgment. So that's a whole bunch of you know, operations don't. Let's talk a little about what I think you should be doing. I think fundamentally what you're looking at is you've got to help your developers make better decisions. So that's on the education side. It's not you know, enforcement. It's more evangelism. We'll talk about that in a second. The other thing is you've got to look at basically better and faster recovery. To some degree, it's preventing downtime. But I think when you try to prevent downtime, it's too easy to look at preventing downtime as actually slowing your, your ability to change the environment. So I would actually focus at maximizing your uh, rapid response and being able to actually respond to um, uh, downtime incidents faster and minimize them. Because that actually gives you the comfort to put more stuff into production, put faster stuff into production, break more often. That ends up basically looking like trying to minimize time to detect, trying to minimize time to recovery. So what does that actually look like for us and for our cloud operations and reliability engineering group? Well, for one thing, it means that our core group, again, cloud operations and reliability engineering, does a lot of, whoops, sorry, um, animation, you gotta love it. Okay, so, um, does a lot of best practice and um, evangelism work and talks about availability patterns with teams. So that means that, for example, when we started moving toward Active Active, which was uh, two or three months ago, um, I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to talk about Active Active, but then Adrian mentioned it. Um, our cloud ops people actually drove the process to figure out how, as an organization, we would switch between regions in case of an, out of an outage and came up with the processes that would support that both in terms of a better understanding of what the decision criteria would be um, and also in terms of some of the tooling around that. It means that our cloud ops people work with teams to adopt things like Latency Monkey and Chaos Monkey to make uh, services more resilient. The other thing that they do is they build alerting. So we have a, an incredibly powerful alerting platform at Netflix. Um, and I know because my team is responsible for it, we built it from scratch. It is, well, here, here's the definition of an alert. There you go. Um, this is what happens when you have PhDs building tools, by the way. So it is an incredibly powerful system. And we've made it easier for people to do simpler things with it. Um, but I would definitely say that our cloud ops group is probably in the top 5% of users at Netflix who knows how to extract incredible value out of our alerting platform. The other things that ops does is they build tools um, focusing on improving TTD and TTR. So for example, Kronos is a uh, tool that uh, ops built. Uh, Adrian mentioned it briefly, uh, but though but not by name that simply basically takes a feed of changes in production because it turns out that, man, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I've had to deal with a production issue, the first question I always ask is what's changed in production? Um, anybody else ever have that question? When it, yeah, okay. So, we, we, and we figured that change control sucks for a bunch of reasons um, and we don't want people to have to report what they're doing. So we actually built a system that lets every system that creates a change in our environment feed into it a log of what it did. That means that we can very quickly, by using Kronos, um, figure out very quickly, uh, sorry, very quickly, uh, what changes happened. For example, what code was deployed or what fast property was changed. It's massively reduced our time to um, react, our time to analyze, and uh, our time to recover. The other thing that uh, they built was the central alert gateway. Uh, this is what happens when you try to find pictures that uh, connote a concept that is kind of hard to find with, uh, <laughs> with reasonable uh, CC uh, attribution. So this is a random picture of the Hoover Dam. But uh, the reason we created the central alert gateway was because when we started using PagerDuty, who here uses PagerDuty, by the way? So PagerDuty is fantastic, right? One of the things that uh, is great about them is when you send an incident with a given incident key and you send a bunch more incidents with that incident key, as long as that incident is open, you don't get more calls, which is great. The thing is, when we are looking at how we wanted to do alerting, we also wanted what we called minor incidents, 
which would just be via uh, email, which PagerDuty, PagerDuty didn't support. So the central alert gateway basically lets you send an event into this, say it's minor or major. If it's major, it goes to page, into PagerDuty. If it's minor, it sends an email to the person who's actually on call based on PagerDuty schedules, but dedupes that and only sends about one email an hour. So it's been incredibly helpful. This was actually sort of a prototype that Core came up with about two years ago, and for the last two years, it's handled something on the order of about 100 to 200,000 alerts per day. Um, it's been really wonderful. Um, more closely to what people know that we've built, we've got Chaos Gorilla, which um, is actually the system we built to simulate losing an availability zone. So how many people know about Chaos Monkey? Okay, so most people. So you guys know Chaos Monkey basically just terminates a given instance in a given application. Chaos Gorilla actually lets us simulate losing a whole availability zone within a given region. Uh, we've used that several times. We try to uh, have manual exercises using uh, Chaos Gorilla at least once a quarter or thereabouts um, to make sure that when we do lose AZs, which happens less often than we fear and more often than we'd like, um, we can actually handle that reasonably well. And most lately, we've got Chaos Kong. So now that we have, now that we have two regions, uh, we want to make sure that we can actually address losing a region pretty well. So whereas Chaos Monkey lost an instance, Chaos Gorilla loses an uh, availability zone, uh, Chaos Kong will actually um, simulate losing an entire region. I don't know what goes beyond Chaos Kong. I think we'll have to leave the simian uh, theme potentially. The last thing that operations ends up doing is, frankly, you know, firefighting. Stuff goes bump in the night, right? And firefighting actually looks like three kinds of activities. On one hand, you've got the low-level coordination. So there is a relatively low-level operations person who will start conference calls, who will page people, who will start, you know, looking at a dashboard when things go wrong. By the way, this is very important. If your ops people's job is to look at dashboards, I would argue you're doing it wrong, because it doesn't matter how good your ops people are. You watch dashboards for enough hours in a day, your brain will rot. But these people will look at dashboards as a way to figure out what's going on once we know that there's a problem. Now, that's sort of at the low-level coordination side. On a higher level, we actually have a role called the engineering crisis manager. Now, from a, for an inter interesting historical perspective, uh, the engineering crisis manager, or ECM, used to be a role that rotated among all managers and directors in uh, engineering. And then it turned out that if you had a manager in engineering who was the crisis manager, who was the crisis manager every like three months, they weren't very good at that. So we now actually have uh, site reliability engineers rotating that responsibility. ECMs are important because frankly, what we find is when you get a bunch of really smart engineers on a call trying to work something out, sometimes they benefit from a little bit of guidance. So everybody wants to go in the right direction and everybody's pretty sure that they know which direction that is. Um, some things that we found ECMs are really helpful in is not pursuing root cause analysis because frankly when we have an outage what we care about is not RCA but you know bringing availability back bringing the service back um, and the other one is sort of coordinating both efforts and sort of plan B's so we're gonna do this and in 10 minutes if we don't see pro uh, progress let's do that it's been incredibly helpful lastly For those who can't uh, read from afar, this is the San Francisco Medical Examiner Mobile Command Unit, which is a bit uh, morbid. So uh, incident reviews. Incident reviews on Netflix are actually pretty easy because it turns out that in an environment that values judgment, that values basically failing more often, um, there's really not a lot of blame and there's not a lot of defensiveness. Um, I remember an incident review for which I was an ECM where we walked in and we said, okay, so let's talk a little about the timeline. And we had the engineer stand up. And then for the next 25 minutes, he walked us through every step that he made and included a lot of commentary like, and this is where I made the wrong choice. This is where I should have included somebody to like check over my work. This is where I should have clicked there instead of this. And basically concluded the whole thing with, and this is how I screwed up. It's all my fault. I'm really sorry, guys. Um, that's, that's a terrible root cause. So... I'm a big fan of, all, uh, of John Ospa and his talk about um, incident uh, postmortems, and uh, I also happen to believe, much like John, that human error is not a root cause. 
because you can't tell humans don't make a mistake. So for uh, a lot of perp for a lot of reasons like that, what we find is that our ops group has to look at these incident reviews and figure out what are we actually going to do, well, how are we going to improve our tooling, our systems to prevent these sort of outages, and not simply take somebody falling on their sword as the you know as the answer to what happened and what we should uh, not do again. So, overall, what does it what does that mean? What does it take? Well, several things. Obviously, grace under pressure. I mean, this is not a Netflix thing, right? I mean, anybody here who's in ops, anybody who's here who's been in ops, knows what grace pre under pressure looks like, and has probably worked with at least one ops person who did not have this. Um, it also means that you've got to have fantastic technical skills, and in our environment, what that looks like is actually two kinds of distinct um, domains. One is an understanding of how to debug very complex, large distributed systems. You know, in our uh, service-oriented architecture, we have something like 500, 600 different applications. Inter-application um, relationships can become a little complex. The other part is actually building tools. If you look at Kronos, if you look at the central alert gateway, if you look at Chaos Kong, um, we're looking for people who are actually pretty strong at building these sort of tools. It means a passion for making things better. I mean, I've got to tell you, I've been at Netflix for a while now, and one of the things that is incredibly rewarding at Netflix is the ability to walk into work every day and make something better. And in fact, that's what we get judged on. And lastly, because it is a freedom and responsibility culture, I was actually um, previewing this with, our, with one of our SREs yesterday, and he said, you know, you should have something there about persuasion, because unlike a lot of ops groups elsewhere, we can't actually tell people what to do. And that means that even though you're working with a bunch of really smart people, sometimes what it looks like is they're doing something, you think they should be doing something different, and then the job there is to actually be persuasive, to evangelize successfully, because you're never going to stand in their way. And um, that's, that's the interesting challenge for me, as somebody who loves persuasion. It's a wonderful opportunity. Um, it's not an opportunity for everybody. So, I want to leave some time for people to ask questions, so uh, I just have a TLDR here. Stay out of the way. Help other people stay out of their own way. Originally, I had something about uh, helping other people not shoot their own toes off. Improve visibility and recover faster. That's it. And that's actually all I've got. So what can I tell you that you don't already know? Uh, hi. Uh, earlier, you were mentioning a case where you had someone go off and do a task. And in one of the previous keynotes, someone said that a requirement means to shut up. And so there's this kind of thinking of like giving people freedom to go out and do things. So I'm just wondering how you kind of like go through the process of defining a feature. Or do you have user stories? Or what's the process of kind of trying to bound what you're trying to do uh, in some sense uh, and give directions to engineers to go build things? I try very hard not to do that. Um, so in this case, Specifically, we're looking at rebuilding the central alert gateway CAG um, because we are moving it from core to my group. We are rewriting it from Python to Scala. Um, thanks for the plug for Python and Scala, by the way, Adrian. So um, I gave it to my engineer. I said, you know, ideally we should try to minimize user pain as part of this uh, process. And ideally we should end this by the end of this quarter. That's it. So from my perspective, that's all that was given in terms of, of context. Now, what she then did is she went and talked to a bunch of our users and, you know, asked them sort of where their pain points were. And you know, really, I mean, you know, the standard stuff, right? I mean, uh, the point is that she did that herself. She was the product owner for this um, system. And she, frankly, continues to be the product owner for this system. So she released a 1.0 that was very successful and now is looking at 1.1 features. And by the way, in at least one of those cases, She's going to release a feature in this product that I don't think she should do, but she owns the product, so she's doing it. Did All that answer your question? So, Roy, uh, you talk about the, you know you have smart people, you give them you know like two or three you know kind of signposts, right? And then you get out of the way. Yeah. So, what do you what do you do most of your time? What, what do you spend? I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way or anything, but like, what? I mean, there's stuff that you're doing that's really cool. What? What is that? You mean other than Slashdot? Um, <laughs> yeah. So I look at the strategic direction for monitoring uh, engineering. So 
my team is actually really good at figuring out where we're going to go over the next quarter. And in fact, if you look at our quarterly goals, I don't really set our quarterly goals. The last time we had a quarterly goals meeting a few weeks ago, I s stood in front of a whiteboard and I took notes. That's fantastic. But I talked to our customers. So for example, uh, Sangeeta um, there is one of the engineering, hi, is one of the engineering managers for our API team, which is one of our leading edge customers. So I have a lot of conversations with API about where they think monitoring uh, needs to be in a year. So we can continue to sort of align our product with their direction. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, I also deal with like you know occasional problems, like my team is frustrated with something, and primarily my job is to get obstacles out of the way of my team, and give my team context about what I see from customers, not from the perspective of specific requirements, but how our customers think about monitoring telemetry and alerting, again, 12 to 18 months from now. Did that answer your question? Yeah, totally. Thank you. Yeah. How does Netflix prioritize across the many different requests? Well, Netflix doesn't. Um, each team figures out how to prioritize across its many different requests. I can tell you what the answer is for monitoring engineering. That's my group. Um, would that be useful? Or So this is something that I, so I've only been managing monitoring engineering for about 680 something. No, 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 sorry. Not that long. So um, the way we figured this out, actually this was a sort of a big sort of aha moment I had about two, three months ago, is we have two kinds of customers at Netflix. Um, and by the way, our customers are all internal development and BI groups. They all sort of consume information from us. We have leading edge customers and trailing edge customers. Our leading edge customers always want, always want more from us and are willing to pay more for that. Our trailing edge customers want us mostly to not change anything. Um, and what I discovered was we can't actually serve those two customer groups equally well because that ends up meaning that you serve both of them pretty badly. So what I've actually come up with officially, and I've had conversations with our leading edge customers, um, and I've had conversations with our trailing edge customers about this, so I've been totally transparent, is we're going to prioritize future development for our leading edge customers. And to whatever degree is possible, we're going to minimize changes um, that affect our trailing edge customers. But our focus in development is what our leading edge customers need and what our leading edge customers believe they're going to need over the next 12 to 18 months. That's it. Now, that's a very high, broad, ambiguous statement, and that's exactly right, because what that actually means on the ground is whatever the engineers who are in my organization think it means on the ground. That's for them to implement. Does that make sense? It seems like a really unsatisfying answer. Hmm? Maybe time for one more. Quick one. Hey, so my question is a lot of what you're talking about is very systematic, right? Sort of end-to-end -end and thinking. Uh, when you're hiring people, like, uh, what do you look for when you're hiring people? Because, it, you know, you're talking about, hey, do the right thing. A lot of people work in organizations where, you know, there may be sort of different values in place and maybe they don't think it systematically. So, you know, Netflix talks a lot about its culture. I would say that um, interviewing is really important to us because fundamentally, you know, when people are the primary asset you've got, you've got to be very careful about your selection. Um, obviously, we look for smart people. Okay, who here works for organizations that say that they look for dumb people? <laughs> so, obviously, we're looking for smart people. We're looking for people with good judgment. We're looking for people with insight, which means that, you know, one of the things that I look at when I talk to people is, tell me about mistakes you've made. Tell me about failures you've had. We're looking for people who are going to be not too arrogant. Um, one of the, I've, I've done a bunch of interviews in Netflix in my time. One of the probably three smartest people I interviewed who we hired lasted 76 days at Netflix because he was a jerk. And Netflix has a no brilliant jerk policy and we take that policy really, really seriously. So that's uh, something where we, you know, lo um, miss something in the interview. We try not to miss that. Did that answer your question? Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. And I have to tell you, I have loved every interaction I've ever had with 
Roy. And uh, anytime I get an email or tweet, usually I have to spend days studying it. So thank you so much, Roy.